All right. All right. Good afternoon. We have Dr. Ken Roy, who is the NSDA Chief Safety Compliance Consultant and Chief NSDA Safety Blogger. He is also the NSELA Safety Compliance Officer, Director of Environmental Health and Chemical Safety for the Glastonbury Public Schools in Connecticut. Thank you for joining us today, Ken, to talk about legal prudence. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. And uh, I wanna welcome you to the Congress. Uh, it's been my privilege to, to speak to you this afternoon and let's get down to it. So uh, you notice the title here is Legal Prudence. Then it goes, are you meeting duty or standard of care? That's a legal phrase. Uh, I do a lot of expert witness work and this is usually what needs to be addressed. Is the teacher and or the administration board of education meeting the duty or standard of care? In other words, uh, as your employer, are they helping to oversee you, keep you out of harm's way as the employee, and you as the teacher in the classroom or supervisor to make sure that you're keeping the kids out of harm's way? Uh, and this all focuses, unfortunately, on something that we call negligence, which I have listed up there as a failure to provide a reasonable standard of care, supervision, or support that results in harm or loss. Obviously, if there's a safety incident or accident, somebody gets hurt, um, not good news for you or your Board of Education. Next. Uh, as, as Matt told you, this is my background. Um, I do, I'm on staff at Glasgow Public Schools. I also have a private safety practice and my biggest client is the NSTA. I handle all of their, their safety items. Um, I do expert witness work. Um, I do mock OSHA inspections, uh, I'm a lag construction consultant, on and on it goes. Go ahead. Uh, very important for anybody watching this, you want to be up to date on safety news. In other words, when have the laws, one of the standards, be it uh, federal, local, your state. Uh, one way of doing that, of course, is to be in touch with the NSTA safety blog and uh, you can see that uh, I've got some of these addresses up here for you. Also five days a week I'm on Twitter, uh, Twitter at Dr. Roy Safer Sci, Safer Sci. And I give you all the up to the date, very right at that moment. Sometimes I get it two minutes before I go on with Twitter. So it's very important information and uh, it's, it's all out there, but this focuses on primarily laboratory safety K through 12. Okay. All right, so what are we gonna talk about in this, this hour? Uh, we're gonna talk about the state of safety state, uh, being proactive. I'm gonna go over just a few legal cases, uh, your duty standard of care. What are expectations of you as a licensed professional? And then we're gonna talk about what are some actions you need to take with your students, actions you need to take as a teacher, and then of course I'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have in the remaining time. All right, let's just take a look very quickly. <clears throat> um, I'm sure all of you are aware of a number of cases. Uh, some of these, I was the expert witness, I won't say which ones, but some of them I was, so I'm uh, very well in tune with what was going on. In this particular case, two students were poisoned by mercury. They stole out of a teacher's unlocked desk drawer. That is key. You have an unsecured hazardous chemical, mercury. Never leave it unsecured, and that's why the teacher went down on this one, all right? Parents sued the teacher administration and board of education, again, for an unsecured hazardous chemical. You don't want to be there. Always lock things up. Okay. Unfortunately, this happened at the same school. A group of parents sued a middle school teacher if they discovered the teacher lets students share blood lancets to do blood typing. The teacher was saying that the Board of Education had in fact cut the budget, so this is why they had to share the blood lancets. Not a good thing. This goes against legal safety standards and all better professional practices. Did not fare well for the school or the teacher. Go ahead. Uh, this was a very interesting one. This is one where there was a demo. Uh, the teacher had invited someone to come in and do a demonstration about neutralization. 
And unfortunately, the teacher called in sick that morning. The principal said, hmm, well, maybe we'll have the gym teacher supervise this, which the gym teacher did. Uh, and unfortunately, two fourth graders were rushed to area hospital. What happened was the uh, demonstrator decided he was going to prove that the dry ice in Y, or the sodium hydroxide, actually, were neutralized. So he dipped something into those solutions and uh, had the kids taste it. Uh, the girl tasted it first, spit it out. You could see that it was burning the inside of her mouth. Unfortunately, the male swallowed it. Uh, very, very severe issues health-wise with the esophagus. Uh, it was just not a good deal. And many of these, by the way, are settled out of court. They never reach court because usually the insurance companies see that this is just going to be a loser issue and they'll want to settle out of court. Okay. Uh, parents sued a science teacher that allowed a group of girls to observe flame test demo. This is all over the news. This is, this is one that happened several years ago, uh, but it just keeps going on and on and on. Teachers don't seem to get it or they're somehow unaware of it. This is when you're using alcohol, usually methanol, and what happens is it flame jets. The problem with that is the flame, the heat, the temperature is so high, it doesn't burn the face. It melts it, all right? So you have disfiguring of that face. Just a nasty, nasty thing. And again, this is a total loser for the school district and the teacher. You would be determined in most instances like this to be reckless, and you probably never get another job. Um, and again, totally avoidable, totally. The NSTA, uh, the, the American Chemical Society, a number of other professional organizations dealing with science education and chemical education have all things out there on the internet. Don't do this. If you're going to do it, do it under a fume hood, and there's a much safer alternative not using the alcohol. Go ahead. Uh, this is a make or rope. This was in 2011. This was in a physics classroom, actually. It's called a whoosh bottle. Again, methanol, the flames. Go ahead, and the next one, you'll see what happened to the kid. Notice the burns on the face. Just nasty, nasty, nasty. If you want to see more about that, you can go to that website. Kid's 15 years old, all right? Uh, you know, I always say I want teachers and kids to go home at the end of the day like they came in in the morning. Not so much for this kid. Just, uh, just a nasty, nasty situation. Go ahead. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is a middle school. And what happened was a teacher was going to have students dissect a flower. And you say, well, how unsafe can that be? Well, hand them scalpels. Again, this is middle school. And just basically said, okay, go ahead and wait till you see what you find inside that flower. Unfortunately, in one day, three students got cut, the last student using it, right across the wrist, if you can see my wrist here, uh, all the tendons, ligaments were cut. Uh, this did go to court. It ultimately went to a district court, three judges. And what was interesting, the head judge asked the teacher, why didn't you say anything about safety? You didn't even mention safety. And the teacher in response basically said, you know, these kids have used this in elementary school, a scalpel, why should I have to repeat it? Right, and this is all on the internet. You can go right to the website and you can see it all. Done. The teacher and the school district were done. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> again, government immunity does not shield a middle school science teacher who failed to take any precautionary measures in the face of known and compelling danger. Right, a lot of times principals will say, oh, don't worry, you're held harmless. There won't be any issue. Not true, not true. When we have something in this, something that happens like this, uh, again, this all deals with duty or standard of care and teachers need training and they need to be aware of that. Go ahead. Uh, neglected this one, an interesting chemistry experiment, leaving students engulfed in a fireball. Again, methanol, 30% burns to his body, he sued for $27 million. This was uh, actually recent and again, Sometimes it goes to court, sometimes it doesn't. When it goes to court, it's a huge loss. The insurance companies pay millions of dollars, but that kid's life will never be the same, either will their families. Okay. Okay, so what is all of this about? Again, due to your standard of care, what does that mean specifically? How can you protect yourself 
and if you're in the leadership, your your teachers, uh, if you're a principal, your employees. All right, there are several things here that I've listed for you that you need to be aware of. One is duty to notify of safety practices and procedures. All right, the teacher has the duty to notify of the safety practices and procedures. Review and have students sign a safety acknowledgement form. All right, and a sample one you can get right there. It's on the uh, website that I've listed. Now, this is not the same as a safety contract, right? This legally allows a kid to sign off on it because all you're saying is, here's some things, you're acknowledging that you've seen this and that you're gonna follow these practices. So again, you wanna make sure that's a safety acknowledgement form as opposed to a safety contract. Uh, the second thing is you have a duty to model the safety, right? Uh, in the case with the flower and the dissection, you teacher had the responsibility to show students how to appropriately and safely use that scalpel, all right? Even when you're having at the beginning of the school year, kids putting on goggles or safety glasses, you need to show them appropriately how to do that. You have to model it. Again, that's under duty or standard of care. Then there's a the duty to warn. Always advise students of dangers, relative safety prior to and during use of potentially hazardous equipment, materials, et cetera. Again, as I meant, back to the scalpel. Remind students scalpels are sharp, they can cut skin before dissecting plant specimens. So you have to have a duty to warn. So you have those three are very important and the next three are also, okay. Duty to inspect for safety before, during, and at the close of any activities. Actively monitor student behavior. Please, don't have the kids working on activities and your back is to them and you're on the internet, Facebook, this, that, or whatever. And again, I do mock ocean inspections. I see this in classrooms that are actively going on. Teachers back to the student. That is not inspecting, all right? Do we do inspect? That's not supervising, all right? You need to be actively moving around that classroom, seeing what's going on. Duty to enforce safety. Always enforce appropriate safety behavior and have well-defined progressive discipline. That's key here, progressive discipline. Uh, you need to enforce safety. So if you see, you tell students that they are supposed to have their eye protection on and you, one or two students don't have it, they have it on their forehead, you don't say anything, you're smoked, you're cooked, it's done, all right? Because you did not enforce the safety. If they've done it several times, you send them out. If that continues, you have them removed from the classroom. You have every right to do that, again, to protect you and the school district. Then there's the duty of maintenance, right? Make sure engineering controls like ventilation, your eyewash station, a fire extinguisher, et cetera, et cetera, your personal protective equipment, everything is operational that meets the manufacturer's standards. For example, the ventilation cap, as you know, on some of the uh, goggles, they have caps, uh, if it's broken off, you don't say, oh, gee, uh, Johnny, uh, hand that in at the end of the period when you're done. No, no, because if something happens, you're it. Legally, you are it. You take it out of operation immediately and you give him a new pair, right? So you have duty of maintenance. You have to make sure everything is operational as it is to be. Okay. All right, so what are the expectations? In other words, legally, in a court, if something is going on here, if there was an incident, uh, what are the expectations of the court for you uh, and or the supervisor? First of all, teachers are trained and not all, but most are licensed and certified professionals, right? That's number one. So that's an expectation. Expectation by the court is that the science teacher will have taken all possible action to help prevent an accident from happening. That means doing a <coughs> safety, you want to take a look at what the hazards are. You want to know at the resulting risks and then the resulting safety actions that you're going to take. That's what the court's going to look at. If you didn't bother trying to determine what the hazards were, what the resulting risks were, and what safety you needed to take, again, you're, legally you're cooked because you did not follow due to your standard of care. What are the prudent safety practices acceptable in a profession? Again, there's legally two different avenues here. There are legal safety standards. For example, there are the OSHA, all right, the hazard communication program, the laboratory standard, personal protective equipment standard, all those kinds of things. Now remember, OSHA does not cover kids. They only cover employees like the teacher, uh, the special ed person that might be in there, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
but there are also better professional practices and better professional practices certainly of like through the NSDA, the ACS, and other organizations, right? So again, teacher needs to know what those practices are. Number four, teacher will protect the student from unreasonable risk or harm. Absolutely critical, all right? Now, reasonable care tests. Here's what you wanna look at in duty care. Was there supervision, all right? And was it adequate? Was it adequate? Was it a safe working environment? Those were all the precautions. If the ventilation, the room ventilation in the lab wasn't working and yet you're doing something that has noxious or toxic type of vapors, not good. All right, you're not, that's not reasonable care. And is it foreseeable or preventable? In other words, did you know? Did you know? Well, can you go back? Wait, yeah. wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> uh, did, did you know? Was it foreseeable? And I've seen instances where the teachers knew, for example, they knew an eyewash station wasn't working. And they said, well, you know, uh, the maintenance department, I, I have a work order in. And yet they're going ahead and doing the lab with concentrated acids. No, you just don't do that, right? So those are the three criteria you want to take a look at for reasonable care. Is there, Number five, is there negligence or breach of duty on the part of the teacher? Again, if you're not meeting that reasonable care test, you're done. Okay. Number six. What's the reasonably prudent person? What are you going to do? Would not allow students or other non-science employees exposure to laboratory dangers. Should an accident occur and a student gets hurt, it's probable that the court would determine the school owed to do some duty of care. Absolutely. Duty or standard of care. Okay. All right. So now we talked about some examples. We talked about what the court expectations are. What actions can we take to make it safer and legally better off certainly not only remember there's shared liability in most of these cases it's not just the teacher but it's also the administration and the board of education they have a responsibility to you as an employee as you have a responsibility to the students so laboratory safety training number one before anything before you do pick up a test tube uh light a bunsen burner uh do anything in that laboratory you must have safety training. Prior to any laboratory work being initiated, science teachers should review safety in the laboratory, including general operating procedures, appropriate use of personal protective equipment, and use of engineering controls. Again, all these things are absolutely critical. Please tell the teachers, do not do any hands-on laboratory work or even demonstrations until those safety precautions are reviewed. Okay. Uh, here's personal protective equipment, which I'm sure you've all seen. On the left are safety glasses, which are useless when you're dealing with hazardous liquids. Do not use those for hazardous liquids. They can be used usually in physics labs or earth space science, not in all cases, but in most. Uh, if you're dealing with projectiles, springs, all right, slinkies, all those kinds of things, you can use the safety glasses. However, the one in the middle is the Primo, the indirectly vented chemical splash goggles, all right? You can use that for almost anything. Again, primarily those are anti-splash. You wanna make sure that you wear them. Uh, and that's, by the way, that's not just during the hands-on. That's during the setup, the hands-on, and the takedown. Three phases must be, those must be worn in all three. The one on the right there, you see all the perforation of those holes? Useless in a chem lab. All right, useless, and I have the research that was done with those. If you get splashed, it goes right through those holes and into your eye. Those can be used like safety glasses, but not goggles, okay. Uh, engineering controls, one of the biggest engineering controls are fume hoods, and there's a big, no, don't do that there. This is a big OSHA violation. Never, never use a fume hood for storage, all right? First of all, unsecured hazardous chemicals. Kids get a hold of that, they take it home, they get hurt, you're it legally. You are it, right? So you never want to do that. Put those back in a chemical storeroom where they're locked up. Okay. All right, now, <clears throat> the second thing is, we talked about this already a little bit, uh, the safety contract or agreement legally, generally, is not enforceable. What is enforceable is the safety acknowledgement document. Once a laboratory training is completed, 
a safety acknowledgement should be presented, reviewed with students, and shared with the parents. Right? Safety acknowledgement documents places the student and parents on notice of risks of harm inherent in the labs and classrooms, identifies specific safety hazards, and warns of dangers. Document also evidences safety instruction. Very important statement. Evidence that there was safety instruction. That can save your butt in a court case saying, well, you know, I went over this, the students, they signed off. To, now, remember, safety cannot be dry by either. You've got to do it throughout the year. You just don't do this at the end of the year and then forget about it. It doesn't work that way, right? The safety guidelines must be followed. It may not be taken as a breach of standard of care. Okay. Uh, other student actions forms maintain the entire time the student is in the school, if not longer. I'm talking about the acknowledgement forms, right? Uh, show students received prior safety training, which is relevant to the knowledge and experience of students, as well as the efforts made by the school to take steps to prevent harm to students. Okay. Now, there is something called statute of limitations, and it depends what state you're in as to what applies. If a lawsuit is filed after a student leaves the school, the safety announcement document should be kept on file as evidence of safety training and awareness. I was, if you know a kid was hurt, I would save that whole class. And you can scan those, you can have them electronically, doesn't, doesn't matter. But the statute of limitations for negligence in most states, not all, is two to three years from the date. So in other words, three years from the accident, the kid might not even be in the school. Let's say they took chemistry in 11th grade and they left. Two, three years after, you could have a lawyer knocking at your door saying you're being sued, all right? After that, no, because the statute of limitations run out. In Connecticut, where I'm from, parents of legal guardians can file a lawsuit as next friends if the child is under 18 years old. Now, while in Connecticut, two or three year rule is the same for as well as adults, in other states, the clock sometimes picks until the 18th birthday. In other words, no matter how old the kid is, they got three years once they turn 18. That's not true in Connecticut. But in, so you need to find out in your state, certainly, uh, what the statute of limitations are in this particular case if there's going to be a lawsuit. Okay. Forms maintain the entire time the student is at the school if no longer, show students receive prior training. Uh, again, if the lawsuit's filed, leave the school, the document should be available. Okay. Safety tests. Once the laboratory training is done, each student should be tested on safety content and skills. So you have theory and practice. All right, let them show you that they know how to put those goggles on correctly or the glasses and the gloves, the apron, etc. Uh, high assessment bar. I wouldn't want to be working in a classroom with a kid that only got 60 or 70 on a safety test. 90, a lot, most people have 100, which is fine. Um, and you get retrained if you can't make it. And you don't do any laboratory work until you pass that test. Again, that's under duty or standard of care. You have the right and the need to do that. Okay. Safety quizzes and tests throughout the school year. Teachers include one or two safety questions. In other words, safety cannot be a drive by experience. You just don't do it at the beginning of the year and then forget about it. Every time you're going to do a demo, every time you're going to do a hands on with the kids, you make sure, first of all, that you review the safety piece that's appropriate for that. And I would also give it to them in writing. Very important. And again, monitor the activity as they're going through it. Make sure and make sure there's progressive discipline. Go. Safety data sheet review. Uh, again, safety data sheets are going to, remember, these kids are going to be out working in the real world, and they need to know how to use these sheets in case they're in a situation where they're dealing with hazardous chemicals in the place of employment. Now, I'm not saying that you have to make copies of the SDSs and pass them out. However, you should reference them, uh, especially, for example, Section 8, where it talks about uh, personal protective equipment, what needs to be worn. On uh, other sections, it talks about the hazards, precautions, how you dispose of it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things are important. So it's good to review the salient points on those safety data sheets, again, before the students work with the hazardous chemicals. Go ahead. Safety drills. So this is another one. Sometimes teachers do this, sometimes they don't. Uh, for example, they'll do a drill, uh, a, a water splash, uh, assuming that it was for example, that it was a concentrated acid, what action do you take uh, if somebody is out cold on the floor? And listen, it doesn't necessarily mean 
It's just the student. It can be the teacher that's out cold on the floor. Do your students know what to do, all right? Um, this is how it's good sometimes to do these drills and practices, okay. All right, we've talked about students, what you need to do with students, but what do you need to do again to protect yourself, to make it safer and to legally protect yourself, right? Number one, lesson plan logging. As an expert witness, all right, I will have your lesson plan subpoenaed through the parent's lawyer because I wanna know, do you ever talk about safety after the first day of school? You always wanna have something. Every time you do a lab work or a demonstration in your lesson plans, make note, reviewed salient safety points, something simple like that. But the point is, so the court can see, yeah, I go over this every time we do something. Go ahead. Department meeting agendas should be a standard, or right, a standing agenda item uh, for your department meeting agendas. Always have something on safety. Um, I own no stock in Foyne Scientific. However, they do have monthly uh, agendas that they put out and they focus on particular safety items and uh, it's ready made. Uh, there is some advertising, but they are, they are good types of things. Uh, otherwise, you can just take sections of your chemical hygiene plan, for example. Even if it's five, 10 minutes from that meeting, very important. Again, this can be part of the defense for you as a teacher and or supervisor and or administrator. Very important. Professional training, you're getting it right now? Absolutely. What's wrong with that photo? I put it in there purposely. You'll notice they have gloves on, they're dealing with glass, they're dealing with liquids. What don't they have? No eye protection, all right? <clears throat> Most states have goggle statutes. And if you don't know if you do, you need to check with your Department of Education. Uh, it's very important to be aware of this and most of these are required to be posted in your laboratory, all right? This is very dangerous what they're doing, right? They should have indirectly vented chemical splash goggles on. Also, the girl's hair should be pulled way back, right? Just not a good scene. And I couldn't tell how often I see this situation, just accidents waiting to happen. It's unfortunate. Uh, so again, safety training programs offered through the country by professional science or like the NSTA. Uh, there's webinars, there's all sorts of things. Uh, that are available. I know the state organizations, not as much as used to, but I know here in Connecticut we do offer some safety things uh, during their conferences and the like, which I've spoken a number of times. Um, it's just a very good thing. Make sure, and always make sure you have the credential there uh, in writing that you attended it, because again, that's going to be in your favor in a legal case, okay? Uh, professional safety resources. Uh, there were many of them out there, but I just wanted to list a few. Uh, OSHA, very good websites, uh, especially if you want to look if you're under a state OSHA or if you're under federal OSHA, or you might be under uh, your own Department of Public Health or something. It depends on the state if you're a non-OSHA state. Uh, very important to know what the expectations are. Your school district is required to train you. I couldn't tell you, I've had umpteen, many, many over the decades, student teachers. It is sad, the lack of training from our tertiary institutions for these kids when they're coming out there. And it's equally sad that I see when I do mock OSHA inspections, the schools don't train the teachers and they're not having the kids trained unless there's a safety incident. When there's a safety incident, they can't get this training done fast enough. I can't believe to tell you how many times I have been called in for this type of a situation. Uh, do it ahead of time, do it in advance, that's what needs to be done, but again, Flynn, again, I want to mention because they are really good when it comes to safety. They're not at the end all and the be all. And they have made mistakes also, but uh, they're good resource out there. Okay. Uh, professional resources, again, uh, number one up here at the top, uh, the NSTA. I see that I still call that teacher. It should be International Science Teaching. That just happened last month. Uh, association, NSTA. Uh, National Science Education Leadership Association. These are the science leaders in the country. And Sela, actually, I'm their safety compliance officer, also in addition to NSDA. Uh, state affiliates, which a lot of you guys are, from what I understand, for NST and in Sela. Uh, state Departments of Education. These are also really good resources, professional resources, because that's what the court is going to want to know. 
Have you done your due diligence as a professional? Have you gone out there? Have you visited the NSTA safety blog, the NSTA safety protocol? Uh, do you know where these things are? Um, have you looked them up as part of your hazard analysis, risk assessment, and safety action? Okay. Um, this one is again the uh, NSTA portal. There's a lot of things by the Safety Advisory Board which I work with and uh, dealing not totally but a good part of it is chemical management, storage, inventorying, disposal, all sorts of things. Uh, I absolutely urge you to take a look at this. Next. Uh, the safety blog, I'm the chief blogger here. Once a month, uh, I put out a blog commentary, which focuses on a specific thing. This is free. Uh, you'd be notified if there's something there. You can also directly ask me questions. The nice part about this is these are shared with everybody else out there that's on the blog. Uh, it has a huge following, and uh, it's, it's great. It's free. Like I said, it's very useful, and again, something a teacher needs to make use of. Okay. It's just a little bit of advertisement. Uh, I've had a number of safety books, and uh, one of my most recent ones is Safety Maker Spaces Fab Labs and STEM Labs. It's all about safety in these particular areas. Uh, the big thing right now, of course, are STEM labs. And many times the science teacher is thrown into this and expect to even to know how to run a table saw or a drill press or something. Uh, that's collaborative, right? You should have tech ed people involved with that. Uh, there's a free interview you can uh, preview, excuse me, preview uh, about the book, and uh, if you want to purchase it, it's there, and uh, it's very, very useful. Again, it's the only one on the planet. There's nothing else out there that deals with safety in these three particular areas. Okay. Uh, State Department of Ed. I told you a member of them. I wrote the ones here. They commissioned me to do this in Connecticut. Again, it's just a sample. Many other states have these. I know Maryland's is outstanding. I've seen that one. Even Pennsylvania has a great one. A uh, number of states throughout the country have these. Uh, but I just put up there again as a reference, um, which talks about better professional practices and legal safety standards. And the uh, addresses are right there. Okay. When you're making decisions about chemicals, should I be using this chemical number one? Because that's something as an expert witness, I want to know, should, have you been, should you have been using that methanol? Should you have been using that mercury? Uh, obviously, you know the answers to these, but the point is, this is still being done. Uh, well, there's better professional practice, and it's called Rehab the Lab. This is out in Washington State, outstanding website. It tells you if it's appropriate for elementary and or middle and or high school. Uh, it tells you how it's used. It tells you how you can store it. It tells you how you can get rid of it very precise, they have over a thousand chemicals, it's just outstanding. So if you're gonna use something for the first time, absolutely check there, and also I would put it in your teacher's uh, log book so, or plan book, so you have it in there and you know that it was done. Okay. Uh, one of the most important papers that NSTA has done, and one that everybody watching this video needs to take a look at, and it's right on their website, liability of science educators for laboratory safety. It just echoes all the things I've been talking about. Very, very important so you know exactly what's happening, what you're responsible for, and what you need to do to keep you and your kids not only safer, but you legally and your school district out of harm's way. Okay. All right, last thing I wanna mention here is laboratory signage. I left it for the last because a lot of times people forget about appropriate signage. Safety signage is needed in that it provides reminders and direction for appropriate behavior. This is what it's all about in the lab, behavior, right? Making sure that students are taking, doing the proper behavior to make it safer. Remember, you as the teacher in there are the one that determines if it's safe or not. Behavior-wise is part of this, right? Very, very important. If you think it's unsafe, all right, you should not be doing the lab, period. I don't care what the principal says, and that sounds like revolution, but the point is you need to be careful because if you know it's unsafe, you go ahead and do it. You're it legally if something happens. You are it, all right? So you just do book work and you work in concert with the administration. Sometimes you need to educate them, which is fine. They need to be aware of what the issues are because, again, 
It's joint liability here. They're going to be sucked into that lawsuit just like you are. All right. So you want to make sure that you have the appropriate signage. Next. I love this, and, it, and it's true. <laughs> when it comes to safety, never assume anything. This is from a balcony over a pool. <laughs> be aware that the balcony is not on the ground level. Okay. And again, this is examples of <clears throat> signage that you actually, number of them you're required to have by law. Uh, first of all, make sure you have a spill kit and you have a spill kit station. Uh, obviously, the fire extinguisher, eye wash, safety shower, and these should be located up near the ceiling. So wherever you are in the laboratory, you can see right where those things are if you need them. Again, of course, this would be part of your training. All right. Uh, one other last word here before there are any questions that I'll entertain. Um, if you have a short-term sub in there, a day or two, if you're out ill, please, seat work only. Because even though you're home sick uh, or you're elsewhere, and that sub's in there, that's not trained, not certified, and something happens, you have the liability because you told the sub to go ahead and have these kids do the hands-on work. And uh, just not a good thing. Don't put yourself in harm's way by doing that. Just seat work. That's it. Okay. That's it. So does anybody have any questions for Dr. Roy at this time? What do you do when your school district specifically puts you in a bad position? So a chemistry classroom with 42 students and one teacher. That's the, that's the state of the school district. So that is the, the practice for the school district. They, and they're required to do less. So what do you do? Did you hear the question, Ken? Uh, only bits and pieces. Can you okay. rephrase so it? It's a chemistry room. You are given a class of 42 students and you are the only teacher and you are being told by administration that you are required to do hands-on laboratory work. The first thing you need to do is you need to know if you have surpassed the occupancy load for that laboratory. Well, who determines that? It's not the principal. It's not the administration. It's not even the superintendent. In most cases, it is the local fire marshal, which who is known as the authority of local jurisdiction. Uh, if you don't feel too good about doing that, have your union do it, right? And uh, they will determine how many occupants, not class size, how many total occupants are allowed to be in that lab when you're doing your hands-on activities. Right, NFPA 101, occupancy load, you're required to have 50 square feet, 50 square feet per occupant net. You have to subtract out the desks, countertops, etc. cetera, all right? Um, so you can have that. Now, the other way of determining that is if you have the architectural prints, maybe your uh, facilities guy has them or gal, um, usually the architects, when they build it, we'll have it listed right on those prints what the occupancy load is. If your principal is surpassing the occupancy, in most laboratories, again, one, one quick way of checking is stationary lab stations. If you have, for example, which most labs are 24, if you have 24 of those stations in there, you know by 30 plus kids in there, you have surpassed it. Now, your problem is this. Remember, you're the one that determines whether it is safe or not. If you go ahead knowing it is unsafe, knowing it's totally overpopulated here, you're not meeting the law, in other words, the code, this is not arbitrary, it's not voluntary, this is law, right? They must follow that. And if they're not following that, and you go ahead and you do that lab, because they're just like, oh, well, I want you to do it anyways, somebody gets hurt, you are it legally along with the principal, but you're it, and there's no way out for you. So what you need to do again is you need to have either the fire marshal come in, look on the prints, sit down with that principal and explain, this is the occupancy load, this is how many students and the teacher are allowed to be in here. 
Now also, the other piece of that is if you have special ed students and you have a special ed teacher or parent in there, that counts as part of the occupancy load. So, and I run into this constantly, and the first thing I hear from the principal, wow, that, that, that's not legal. Was, yeah, it is. It's not arbitrary, all right? It's not voluntary. That is legal. And again, that's the problem for you. You want to make sure you need to know the first place you start is what's the occupancy load of your lab? Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. Ken, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. I know you're busy. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day to talk about this very important um, subject matter with us today. I really appreciate that. Also the opportunity to speak to you guys today. And please make use of the NSTA blog and the portal. You can get a hold of me right on the blog directly. Uh, you also have my email. If you have a question, I'd be more than happy to help you out. And have a safer day. <laughs> All right, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.